So we started the year off with Channel Awesome, taking a look at the great Linkara's cinematic debut. But it's time to move on to greener pastures. Let's take a look at some actual quality, a real piece of art, pure, certified, Kino. That's right, we're talking about Demo Reel. Nah, I'm just kidding, it's Berserk Memorial Edition. the ground, rivers run red, our brothers drown, taking away everything we had, our spirit ain't free, our body's dead. So yeah, we're talking about Berserk again, which is pretty killer. Some of you guys might be wondering why I don't make more videos about this series. It's popular. It gets views. I love this series. So why not milk it some more? Well, it's specifically because I don't want you guys to get exhausted to Berserk. The last thing I want is for you guys to loathe getting a notification about a Berserk video any point in this channel. So these videos will be spaced out, yet not rare. There's still a whole lot of ground to cover for this franchise, to put it simply. And if we're lucky, it'll keep going and give everybody more animes and chapters to enjoy. Maybe even a video game if you're all good boys and girls. And who am I kidding, this series is cursed. Anyway, the Memorial Edition is sort of a redux or director's cut version of the Golden Age movie trilogy, made as sort of a tribute to Kentaro Miura in a celebration of the manga's continuation under the charge of Koji Mori. It includes new scenes not originally in the movie trilogy, and a touch-up to the scenes that were already in the film. Now, the Golden Age trilogy was an interesting beast when it came out. Starting in 2012 and ending in 2013, the project's goal was to kick up enough interest to start a whole movie franchise adapting the rest of the story to Berserk. And if you don't know what that is, watch the 21 hour long video, it's a lot to cover to put it lightly. All you have to know is that Berserk is a dark fantasy horror epic that takes place in a Dark Ages inspired fantasy land, about a mercenary turned demon hunter named Guts on a quest to get vengeance on the man who cursed him and his lover, to be hunted by demons until the day they die. It has themes of vengeance, redemption, nihilism, loss. It's a lot more than just big guy with sword fucks up monsters. And there's been more than a few attempts to adapt the series into an anime. I did a whole video going over each adaptation, but I'll give a brief description here. You had Berserk 97, which is widely considered the best one, though it's still pretty flawed with budget issues limiting the animation and cutting out major story beats that outright impact the ending. Though the soundtrack by Susumu Hirazawa is still remembered to this day, because it's godlike. And this is still probably the most accurate adaptation of Golden Age, beyond missing a few elements, like Skull Knight, Donovan, Puck, and Wylad. Yeah, his name's actually Wild, but I read a bad scan like 10 years ago, and the name stuck in my brain ever since. And I'm gonna keep calling him Wylad because it pisses you guys off. And also no Salat, which makes me sad because he's fucking cool. Regardless, these are the only missing elements to 97, which still cause some noticeable holes if you've read the manga. Especially because of the significance each of the removed element has to the larger story. Skull Knight going missing means the ending doesn't make any sense. Donovan causes the scene in the woods with Casca to not have as much impact. Puck being missing means the Black Swordsman episode sort of stumbles around until it can get to the end fight. Salat and the Baki Raka being gone means you don't have a hint towards the larger story that Golden Age was trying to set up, which was later explored in Conviction, and Wylad being gone means no Gorilla Maxing. But you still have a lot of the character building moments that make people love Golden Age. Seeing Guts go from a standoffish kid who doesn't want to get close to people to a trusting and loyal soldier for the band of the Hawk. It's a great arc. Berserk 97 makes sure to keep the vibe. Now, Berserk 2016 and 17 never happened. They were garbage, and their only purpose was to kill confidence in the IP, meaning it was stuck in limbo for a long-ass time until they'd finally decide to put out Memorial Edition. Also, it covered the arcs after Golden Age, like Conviction and Millennium Falcon War, so that's a plus, I guess? Now, the movies were a different story. So many big and small moments were cut that you basically got a speedrun version of Golden Age, going through major plot beats in order to get to the important 
important scenes, even though they cut so much out that it removed elements that became important later, like Minister Foss. Also, it ended up ironically killing the emotional weight of the big parts. Now, it did include a lot of the stuff that was cut in 97, the supernatural elements that the director of the original anime didn't like, such as Puck and Skull Knight, and even referenced Donovan, though never making Guts' childhood 100% clear. So, you have an interesting back and forth between the movies and 97. Stuff that one includes isn't in another, but both have a rough idea of the Golden Age arc. And fans took notice of this. There's entire edits that exist to smash the two adaptations together into one large project, patching the holes in each adaptation and trying to create a definitive anime for everyone to watch. The most famous of which being the Berserk Redux edit, and I don't know if I'm just crazy or if this is actually something that happened, but I could have sworn this was called the Band of the Hawk fan edit. I distinctly remember it being called that. And yet when I pointed out to people in the original anime video, they were confused, since it was called Berserk Redux instead. And maybe it's just the Alzheimer's kicking in, that's been a problem lately. And maybe it was just the Alzheimer's kicking in, it's been- Anyway, you get the idea. There's a fan edit that combines both anime adaptations together and tries to give you a full view of the Golden Age trilogy, minus a few things that neither talked about. I demand my goddamn demon monkey. Well, the Memorial Edition was sort of marketed as being the answer to this problem, having scenes that were cut out of the trilogy put back in, adding in new bits, and re-recording dialogue with the original actors to essentially patch it as best as possible, even going back and touching up the CGI to give it more detail, since there were moments in the films where it looked wonky, and they decided to release it as a 13-episode anime series instead of full-length movies, taking the films and chopping them up into 24-minute episodes. Admittedly, it sounds like a cheap cash grab when you put it that way, but personally, I ended up really liking Memorial Edition. Yeah, it does run into the problem of you're just watching the movies again, but there's more here under the surface than you think, including some additions that legit came out of nowhere and shows that Studio 4C has a lot of love and respect for Berserk. They just got hamstrung by a problem, and I'll talk about that towards the end. So the basic structure of the anime is this. First three episodes cover Egg of the King, the first movie in the trilogy. There's no noticeable addition. You still don't have Guts' first battle with the Band of the Hawk, or addressing the fact he doesn't like to be touched. No first night with the Hawks where Casca has to scare away Corcus and his buddies. It plays out pretty much the same as the first film. The only real addition is in episode 2, where there's a 5 or so minute montage of the events of the films with forces playing. Yeah, they added an AMV to the second episode as almost like a trailer of what's going to happen. Some people complain that it has spoilers in it, since it pretty much shows every major event from Golden Age, including the Eclipse, and they've got a point, but Memorial Edition only really ever sold itself as a project for the fans, so it's in weird territory. On one hand, it was a cool celebration of Berserk, especially considering the circumstances that caused the Memorial Edition in the first place. On the other, yeah, newcomers will pretty much know exactly what's going to happen going into this, but eh, fuck it. Now, the second movie is where things get interesting. This was probably the most push change. Every fucking piece of advertising material focused on this. The Bonfire of Dreams. The Bonfire is a fan favorite moment for Berserk, and it's one of the highlights of Golden Age. You see, right after Guts kills over a hundred enemy soldiers to distract them and protect Casca, who runs off to get help after they got separated from their main army, they have a moment to just sort of sit down and talk to each other. Here, Casca finally realizes that she misjudged Guts. From the beginning, she thought he was just an arrogant, irresponsible brute, and now sees him as a much deeper man. This is also the moment where she starts to develop feelings for him. It's a major scene for their characters and the story, because it's also where Guts announces he's going to leave the Band of the Hawk. This is a crucial part of Golden Age, one that sets up the entire finale, and directly causes the rest of the story. It not being included in the second movie was a major point of contention among fans, since it reinforced the point that the movie's focused on action and rushing to the cool moments, instead of allowing the slower parts to let the audience sink in and give a shit about the characters, which is what makes the action intense in the first place. So Memorial Edition really hammered home that they included the Bonfire of Dreams. It even got a ton of focus in the trailer, with an original song being recorded and everything. It's clear they understood how big of a deal it was to include it here. And it wasn't bad. They pretty much adapted it page by page. You even have Casca getting the elf dust from Judo and handing it to Guts. The only part that's missing is the two of them heading down from the hill to meet Griffith, who comes back from a meeting with the generals to make sure they're okay. It's still 99% of Bonfire Dreams, but not gonna lie, I am sad they didn't have the Griffith sequence. It had that funny joke where Guts smacked Casca's ass. Regardless, they didn't do a bad job. 
Even if it's completely CGI, it doesn't look half bad. They stylized it well. Honestly, if there was a Berserk game with this CGI in it, it would actually be pretty killer. Other than that, the second movie plays out almost completely as normal. The Battle of Doldry goes the exact same, there's still no Zod to help out Guts with Baskon. Casca and Guts don't get their moment after the fortress is captured. The pedophile noble Genin never gets his backstory, you never find out his relationship with Griffith. They do add in Casca's monologue at the cave after her and Guts fall off the cliff, though she never goes into her childhood or Griffith's mental breakdown after doing his deal with Genin. They also add in the scene with Guts as he tries to leave the Hawks, but it's shifted a little. You still don't get the subplot with the Queen and Minister Foss where Guts and Griffith basically murdered the entire Midland aristocracy. Yeah, that's just dead and gone, you're never getting it. But they still took the time to at least add in this moment, even if they do shift a lot of details. You see, in the manga in 97, Casca gets their attention and the guys all go to a tavern to understand why Guts wants to leave. Meanwhile, Casca's warning everyone else to try and stop Guts. Corcus mainly shit talks him the entire time, and you understand that even though Corcus fucking hates this dude, he genuinely kind of feels betrayed at the idea Guts is throwing away all of this just for what he believes is a dumbass dream. And Judo's there to kind of basically play the nice cop to Corcus's bad cop, essentially trying to reason with Guts and empathize with him to understand why he even wants to leave in the first place. Then Guts and Judo walk in the snow as he tries to convince him to at least stay for Casca since he knows they like each other, which leads to Guts admitting that he's interested interested in Casca, but he doesn't feel like he's worthy of her yet. Memorial Edition keeps this entire conversation completely within the tavern, and it's just Guts and Judo. Corcus isn't there. It plays out pretty much exactly like in the manga, just without Corcus there to be a dick. They have their whole conversation, they just never leave. After that is the duel with Griffith and the ending of the second movie, from episode 4 all the way to episode 8. Episodes 9 to 13 are all the third movie, and this has some interesting shit to it. So, the third movie was the closest in terms of the actual manga, only really missing Wylad, Guts staying with Godo and Erika, Griffith hallucinating a better life with Casca, Guts talking to Gaston before he dies, and the full ending after the eclipse. It's still hands down the best adaptation of the God Hand in the Eclipse, since it's one hell of a sequence, but the Memorial Edition decided to add something I plain did not see coming. So when Guts and Casca realize they're in love and have sex in the woods, there's a scene where Guts has a mental breakdown. For those unaware, he was raped as a child by a mercenary named Donovan, who paid his adoptive father Gambino for the privilege. Guts murdered him in the next battle, and because of that he couldn't save Gambino from losing his leg, causing a dark spiral that ended with Gambino trying to murder Guts in a drunken rage, even admitting he did let Donovan rape him purely because he hated the kid that much, blaming him for the death of his lover Shisu. It's a dark sequence that fucks Guts up, to the point he develops a phobia of being touched, and this is a big part of why he has trust issues like he does, and his mental breakdown with Casca is all about this, flashing back to his rape and even strangling Casca while hallucinating, and it leads to a pretty heartbreaking sequence where Guts just spills everything out to her. His childhood, what Gambino did to him, what he did to Gambino. It's a grim moment in the story. Guts even admits that Gambino is the one person he regrets killing. Even after being a soldier his entire life and killing countless enemies, only Gambino is the one he felt guilt over. Casca decides that she can help Guts move past his trauma, since she herself let him see her vulnerabilities back in the cave, and the two are able to bond as lovers. Understanding that, while they might never get the dreams they truly wanted in life, they can at least be there for each other. All three adaptations avoided this scene as hard as possible, and it's reasonable as to why, since it's very dark subject matter, outright pedophilia and PTSD. Not exactly the most marketable shit to put it lightly, but it's a scene fans wanted in anime to cover for a long time. It's another favorite, since it's a fantastic scene of these two broken people comforting each other. You see this big brute, this stoic badass that you've been following this entire time reduced to a sobbing mess. I mean, the guy is not in a good place. Well, Memorial Edition decided to take the plunge and actually adapt this chapter, which is known as Wounds. Yeah, they took the plunge and fully covered it, not even trying to soften the blow. It goes into everything. It is literally page by page. It talks about Donovan. It shows gut strangling Casca. He has the mental breakdown. They really said fuck it and covered the scene. And that's something I outright commend them for. Hell, they already earned points for daring to address Donovan in the first place, even if it was just a weird psychedelic dream sequence. So them doubling down for the Memorial Edition feels fitting. It's Studio 4C going, fuck it, what do we have to lose? I especially like the way it was handled. When Guts is giving his monologue on what happened, there's no background music. There's no kind of visual or any attempt to, like, make it psychedelic. It's just 
ambient sound effects, the waterfall, the birds chirping, it's carried by haunting dialogue. Some people think the crazy guts face is silly, but of course it's gonna look weird out of context. Personally, it didn't bother me, and it makes sense why he looks manic and out of his mind, because he was. Now, if you're only watching the Memorial Edition, it's gonna come out of fucking nowhere. The dream sequence plane isn't enough to set up the fact that Guts was raped as a child, especially since it removes all the foreshadowing and buildup, like his nightmare sequences and fear of touching people. But once again, this is more a project for fans. Still, the only actual change after this is after the Eclipse. I mean, beforehand, you do have a scene where Rickert actually buys the elf dust they use to save Guts and Casca, but it's not from the performer troupe, so no Skull Knight saving him from demons again. They included the declaration of war speech Guts has, when he declares his intent to hunt down Griffith and kill him. It's a cool sequence. The speech itself is still a great fuck yeah moment for Guts, since he goes on to kick serious ass. But it still doesn't have Casca giving birth to the demon infant or addressing Goto and Erika. You don't even see him getting the Dragon Slayer like how he does in the manga. It's that after credit scene that was at at the end of the third movie. It's still exactly the same as the third movie, you just get a speech that explicitly says Guts is gonna go on a revenge path. So Memorial Editions additions aren't all over the place, but I'd say they saved them for what matters, covering territory that none of the adaptations really went before. Wounds and Declaration of War alone are worth the price of admission, at least I'd say. It's definitely the best option if you haven't seen the trilogy and want to check it out. You can just watch the Memorial Edition and get the exact same experience as the movies, but with more stuff to it. But, if I'm gonna be honest here, the best thing Memorial Edition is gonna do is serve future fan edits. Now there's even more scenes to throw in that'll make it closer to the manga. Still missing Donovan actually attacking Guts, Skull Knight still isn't in the right place, because the third movie puts him right after he has sex with Casca instead of right after leaving the band to the Hawk. You still don't get Salat showing up, at least where he was actually introduced in the manga, at the festival where Guts is fighting, but he's only introduced in the third movie as actually attacking Casca's camp. There's also no Bakiraka assassins, there's, there's still a lot of stuff that wasn't in either adaptation, and that is sad. And yeah, most importantly, still no Wild. Yeah, I said it right this time, wanna fight about it? But you get the point. Now, I actually wanna talk about Wild for a bit. While he's never been included in any adaptation beyond Berserk Muso, he was actually pretty close to showing up in the movies. They wanted to include him, but thanks to runtime issues, they couldn't. And now, I can talk about the biggest issue with the film trilogy. The Berserk movies should not have been movies. There's simply too many problems that the format bring up for it to be a reliable option for Berserk. Here's what I mean. The movies had two big issues for them. They didn't have a lot of budget to tell a massive story, which they also didn't have a lot of time to tell. Movie runtimes are a fickle thing. You can't have a movie be too short or your audience feels like it wasn't worth it. It also can't be too long, or audiences will feel intimidated on top of theaters not wanting to pick up your film, since you take up time that can be used for other movie showings. It's a delicate balance. The point is that movies don't really work well for long-term storytelling. Sure, you have franchises that can get up to the dozens, but those are very rarely one coherent story told across multiple films. It's mostly standalone titles that are tied together by one central character or a similar theme. James Bond, Godzilla, slasher movies, you know what I mean. Hell, people are already pretty exhausted of the yearly Marvel routine, popping in to see movie after movie, going to and from a theater over and over again, but it actually took a while for Marvel burnout to set in. After a series of movies coming out each year, the big arc being over and done with, and the encroaching spin-off shows that basically turned into full-blown homework. Studio 4C actually managed to make this a bit more obnoxious, and could have possibly contributed to why the movies didn't perform well. The first movie came out February 4th, 2012, in Japan. The second movie came out June 23rd that same year. That's four months between the two, not even half a year later. It's to the point, I have a theory. Was the movie trilogy intended to be in anime, then got turned into movies? And now turned back into anime? The idea that they had two movies ready, not even four months apart from each other, definitely makes me wonder if this was the case. Especially considering the runtime for the first movie was only 77 minutes. That's barely above feature length. So we might have a weird situation here of an anime or an OVA being converted to theatrical films, and now they're being turned back into an anime. But the problem is that this severely impacted the revenue each movie made. First movie made about 1.4 million, but by the time Advent, the third film, came out, it barely brought in around 400,000. 
It clearly did not pick up the momentum needed to kickstart a new project for Berserk. It could be because the first two movies were too spaced together, the issues fans had where, thanks to runtime causing cuts, all the beloved moments people wanted weren't included, so you had an issue where newcomers felt it was too rushed and they didn't really get it, and fans were angry because the moments they wanted to see weren't there. Studio 4C clearly had bigger plans for this. They animated pitch videos covering stuff like Black Swordsman and Conviction, hoping to get the green light for them. This is actually why I'm thankful they did Memorial Day because Berserk works best with a simple long-term anime. Trying the movie route did not work. It was too much of a risk that had no real reward waiting for it. Even if it did keep going, could you really imagine that working out properly? More stuff would need to be cut for runtime for each entry. How would you even plan multiple movies with this franchise? People would have quickly gotten exhausted of going to a theater every few months to watch a new Berserk movie. Granted, nowadays you have streaming services working to essentially kill theaters and become the primary way people watch media, but it's still not a good excuse to completely dedicate to the movie franchise route. It's just something that makes me go, why are you fixing something that isn't broken? Chainsaw Man's anime has a shitload of detail and passion put into it, and it's able to tell the story perfectly well beyond a few things getting cut, like the Muscle Devil. But it didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes the most brilliant thing you can do is stick to a simple formula and do it very well. And honestly, I think that is the big lesson with the Berserk movie trilogy in this Memorial Edition. Don't reinvent the wheel. People would be more than happy with a traditional anime series that covers the whole story as good as it can, over a forced attempt to make Berserk a phenomenon, with movies and merchandise all over the place. You don't have to oversell this series. It can simply stand on its own. It absolutely can stand on its own, if you just let it. Hell, they've been able to hold multiple art exhibitions in Japan just showing off Miura's art. There's clearly a built-in audience who love this series, enough to keep it going. All you need to do is actually capitalize on that, instead of going dead quiet. And this brings up another weird thing that I notice all the time with the people who own the Berserk IP. There's this weird, circular marketing strategy that popped up. The owners of the Berserk rights love hyping up shit with these cryptic, vague marketing messages. Something big is coming, guys. We're working on something you're gonna love. Then it comes out, and it's the art exhibition or announcing drink coasters. I mean, that's cool, but I don't understand why they had to make it some big event. The most recent example was the countdown that started out of nowhere. For those unaware, the official website for Berserk had a countdown that was running. Nobody knew what it was, and there was a lot of speculation among the fans on what it could be. Was it announcing a new anime? New game? More chapters? There was a lot of theories going around. Then the countdown ended, and it was... The Blu-rays. The Blu-rays for the Memorial Edition. Which are 300 bucks a pop, so... Yeah. You see what I mean? It's a weird marketing strategy that builds up hype just for something... I wouldn't really know to call it small, but everyone knew Memorial Edition was getting Blu-rays, so why the cryptic teasing? I don't know. It feels like baiting people just to disappoint them, which could lead to thinking people aren't as interested in the IP as they actually are. People love Berserk, they just don't love being run around only to be sold jacket zippers. Hell, the stuff they don't end up hyping up actually ends up being the more interesting news, like how the original dub cast from 97 and the movie trilogy are coming back. So yeah, Mark Dereisen, Carrie Corrennan, and Kevin T. Collins are going to voice their roles again, which was a major point of contention in Berserk 2016, when the entire English cast was basically booted out, to the point Kevin T. Collins was legitimately outraged and felt like he was screwed over. Of course, it makes sense they would come back. This is technically an expansion pack to the Studio 4C movies, which they were the voice roles for that, so it would probably be a major legal minefield trying to figure out how to even replace them if they've already voiced the majority of the material. I don't know. I mean, as stated, the Berserk exhibitions are a big event. I'm not going to shit-talk them and say there's some massive disappointment nobody wanted. They're still holding strong in Japan, even after Miura's death. But it's something that only really impacts the Japanese side of the fanbase, so... I don't know. Regardless, this is all ancillary shit. For now, the manga is back on hiatus, which is fun, but there's still a ton of stuff to talk about. I haven't even talked about the Grumbeld novel or the PS2 game. We're not done with Berserk just yet, bros. But for now, I'm gonna call it. Hope you guys check out Memorial Edition and tell me what you think. You can find it on your anime pirate side of choice. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. Going on. Hey loser, do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're gonna be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt.
Everyone's going to look at you funny. There's going to be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not, you know, you're not buying my shirt. They're going to plant crack in your house, and they're going to arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt.